So good day, everyone. So thank you for um, joining my session. So for the next 20 to 25 minutes, we will be talking about how to secure JavaScript applications. So again, this is going to be a holistic talk, and we're going to talk about a few things which generally don't get to be discussed in technical team meetings. And this, this is definitely something which would help you in your careers as tech professionals. So I'll share a quick story before we begin. So 15 plus years ago, when I was a little kid, so this is not me, this is an AI generated image. But when I was about eight or nine or 10 years old, a few years ago, um, I really wanted to play games all day long. I mean, like, like most of us, we want to just play games and then we don't want to do anything else. We want to start um, opening that console and then turn on the TV and then play games for about 10 to 15 hours per day. However, my parents had other plans. They wanted me to study. And the funny thing there is that they weren't there to, um, to keep track whether I was studying or not. And in most cases, if I was left all alone, I would literally just play games and not really care about studying. I mean, when you are young, would you really appreciate how much, um, how much, how, how important studying is? So what they did is given that they would be there in the morning and then for 10 straight hours, they would go to work and then they would come back. They would go back home around maybe 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. in the evening they decided to lock the adapter of my game console. So I was using PlayStation and yeah, using it for 15 hours straight before they implemented this. So what they did is they would give me homework. They would give me an assignment. They would want me to finish a reading material. And then when they go back home, they would unlock the they would remove the lock and then they would give the adapter to me so that I can play games. However, the problem there is I usually get to finish my homework much earlier. Maybe in two to three hours, I get to finish what I needed to do. And the problem there is that I had to wait for an additional seven to eight hours before they come back home and give me the adapter because I won't be able to play the game without um, the adapter which connects the console um to the to the electric network so what happened when i was younger is that i decided to open the lock myself using the tools available at home maybe it hair clips or maybe pieces of wires that allowed me to open the locks and the funny thing there is that i was able to do so even without any sort of training because when we were younger we really wanted to do anything we wanted to do, whether they're good or bad, right? And then what happened after I learned how to open these locks was it allowed me to open the locks way ahead right after I finished studying. So after finishing my homework, let's say one to two hours, I was able to immediately open the lock, play maybe for about four to five hours, and then I returned the adapter back into the cabinet and then return the lock back. And then after a few hours, my parents would arrive and they would be surprised that I am a very behaved person and I didn't even try to open the lock. So they, they weren't aware that I was able to open the lock. So I, I was able to, to make the most out of the time. So I was able to study and play. However, after uh, a few weeks, they discovered that I was able to open the lock. Because when you use the adapter, um, even if you wait for a few hours, it becomes warm. So when they returned the adapter back to me, they noticed that it was already used. So they noticed that I was able to play games and I was able to open the lock. So what they did was uh, they made the challenge much tougher. Because for one thing, the adapter is about this big and it wouldn't make any sense for them to bring the adapter. So they usually bring keys. 
So what happened after a few weeks, to a few months, they decided to have multiple locks to prevent me from getting the, the adapter. So of course, the moment that it became like this, it got much tougher to get the adapter from the cabinet. But of course, as a child, I was still able to open these locks. But of course, it took a longer period of time to get what's inside. And at some point, when I got a bit older and this is still being implemented, I just decided to buy my own adapter <laughs> because it didn't really make any sense to, to, to open the locks, especially if it's almost impossible to open it without breaking the entire cabinet. So that being said, um, that story, again, is true. It really happened 15 plus years ago. And here we can see that even as a young child, um, if a young child can do that, then what if someone with enough motivation would do the same thing to other locks, whether they're physical or digital? So fast forwarding by another 15 years. So here we are right now. So to introduce myself, I am Joshua Arvin Latt, and I am the Chief Technology Officer of NewWorks Interactive Labs. I am also an AWS machine learning hero, and I'm the author of three books. The first book being Machine Learning with Amazon SageMaker Cookbook. Second book would be on Machine Learning Engineering and MLOps, Machine Learning Engineering on AWS. And then my third book is on Automation, Cloud Security, and Penetration Testing. So the title of that book would be Building and Automating Penetration Testing Labs in the Cloud. So good news for everyone. So for those who love reading books, there's a fourth book coming out, uh, maybe end of this year or maybe early next year. So the title of that book would be Learning Serverless Security. So definitely, that's a very important topic. And without further ado, let's continue the topic we have at the moment, which is on how to secure JavaScript applications. So navigating or going back to our reality, the moment that we start working, we start working for a business, we start working for a company, and then we start working with teams, Suddenly, even if we think that security is very important, the leaders and the uh, business owners generally deprioritize security. The number one priority of these business owners and leaders would, of course, be the short-term financial objectives as well as the long-term financial objectives. The businesses have to survive first before you can even think about the other things. And in addition to that, we have to make sure that the clients and customers are happy. That being said, compliance in most cases will always be deprioritized. And unless an organization gets hacked or attacked or compromised, that's the only time that there will be some budget allocated to keep things in place. So again, when you have tech teams, when you have IT teams working towards building a system or a product, again, security will always be deprioritized in most cases as usually there will be very strict timelines and there will be very minimal time to be spent on auditing and securing the systems. This is the reason why there's a big percentage of the systems deployed in the cloud or in production which are inherently not secure. Therefore, when there are attackers who want to attack the systems, they have a higher chance of attacking this, especially if there's no team in charge of taking care of the security of the systems. So one of the things that I want to share with you is that developers would generally lean towards convenience over security. When there are tight or strict deadlines, the number one priority of developers generally would be to make the system or the website work. And sometimes the browser will update itself or you will use uh, a newer version of the browser. Then suddenly one of the developers would say, oh, my website stopped working because of CSP. So what is CSP? So if some of you have already encountered this, CSP is what they call the content security policy. It's a security mechanism which prevents cross-site scripting. And if the developer downplays what XSS can do to a website, then they would definitely just configure this to just allow 
what shouldn't be allowed. Therefore, in terms of like, like getting the, the job done, they will say, well, nothing's hacked yet, so I'll just get things working now and then we can just fix it later. So right now, again, the question would be on convenience versus security. However, the developers are not aware that if you just learn how CSP works, maybe spend two or three hours understanding how the configurations work and understanding what's the best way to set things up, then there would be less problems moving forward. Because if you were to configure CSP after the entire application has been built, then there is risk of the work being uh, done again, or basically there's rework because you may have to configure the implementation a bit, especially if CSP affects the current implementation. Basically, your application stopped working because of the strict security configurations. So what does CSP prevent? So again, it prevents attacks like this. So you have something called cross-site scripting, and if there are malicious users who's trying to make your application or website do something else, then they would easily be able to inject scripts like this. And if there's, there are no security mechanisms in place, then your website may just cause harm to the end users. So there are different types of XSS. And in some cases, sometimes the admin users who manage the entire website may get affected as well, not just the customers. That's the reason why teams should be able to configure and implement CSP as early as possible. And it may take a bit of time to make this as granular as, as possible, but definitely before your application gets deployed into production, it is important that CSP has been discussed by both the development team and the team trying to audit and enforce some security mechanisms. In addition to that, in addition to understanding the different security mechanisms that we can configure, it's also important that the team building the applications have a good understanding on what the default security configurations are of the libraries and frameworks being used. Sometimes the teams would just say, okay, there's a security checklist, let's just follow that. However, when dealing with security, you have to understand what the application is doing. And at the same time, there's really no single checklist which could really help ensure that the site is 100% secure. So understanding the intricacies and the details and the differences when using the different libraries and frameworks is crucial because if you forgot to turn the configuration on, let's say, is this production mode or not production mode, then your application may already be vulnerable to certain types of attacks. So definitely that's something that developers should keep in mind when trying to secure their applications, whether it's in staging mode or production mode. Sometimes developers would say, oh, I'm just going to secure it when we're already going to deploy to production. But my recommendation is that the staging environment should at least be secured and hardened as early as possible. So that when you have to deploy it into production, it's much faster because the staging configuration is very close to the production conf configuration. Earlier, in the last couple of slides, we've been focusing on how we use JavaScript for the front-end code. However, JavaScript can also be used for back-end. And here, we have a simple example on how we use JavaScript to, let's say, compute or we have to emulate something like a calculator application where we have a user enter a mathematical expression. So here, if you already know the problem in this code, you pretty much know that evil is being used to process the expression uh, inputted by the user. But again, developers may not be aware of such issues. So again, this is just a very simple example to demonstrate a point. So developers, may also be aware that evil is evil or evil should not be used. But they really have no idea why that is and how attackers may be able to take advantage and compromise this piece of code. 
So let's say that we have this application and then we run it and then it asks us enter a mathematical expression and then the user would input one plus one. Then yes, the application would return two. And it's what the application is supposed to be doing. That's the bare minimum. And the developer would at least say, at least I did my job because you need to implement the logic and get it working for the different scenarios requested or required. However, the application prepared by the developer has some vulnerabilities. And if something like this gets inputted instead of a mathematical expression, what if you input code there? What would happen when the application continues to run? So after the application, um, accepts the input, it would then create a hello.txt file inside the same directory where the application file is stored. So again, this is not a mathematical expression. Suddenly something got injected and the application is now doing something which is not expected to do. So while you guys think that this is harmless, what if? an attacker decides to open, uh, basically run the following command, and it's now listening in a separate server. So you now have an attacker server listening somewhere out there and waiting for a target machine to be compromised. And then the target machine would now connect back to an attacker machine. So now with an attacker machine waiting somewhere out there, the vulnerable application is now expected to run again. And then instead of a mathematical expression, we run the following input. We provide the application the following input. And you would be surprised that if you replace the IP address with the IP address of the attacker machine, then the target machine where the application is running, it would now connect back to the attacker machine. So again, the target machine would connect back to the attacker machine. So what will happen next? Once there's connection, the attacker can now access what's inside the target or the victim machine. And we can safely say that the attacker can do anything he or she wants and maybe escalate some privileges and steal some data, crack some passwords, or cause some additional harm to the account where that server is running. So again, it's a chain and there are different steps and different ways an attacker could compromise different parts of your application. So right now, if you were to ask a developer how this is done, most probably the developers won't have any idea on how these applications could get compromised. So if the developers have no idea how these systems can be compromised, then it would be hard for them to secure these types of systems. So in order to learn how to defend, it might be best to learn how to attack also. So in summary, what we have here is the victim machine running some malicious input, and then the victim machine would connect back to the attacker machine. So again, these are, these are just some sample and some simplified examples on how to get this done. Then there are definitely more advanced ways to get this completed. So how do you protect the systems? There are various ways, and this is one of them. The first one would be to utilize something like an automated vulnerability management service or tool. This allows your servers to be automatically scanned whenever there's a change. So there are various implementations of vulnerability management services and scanners. So there are scanners which, when run, would scan an endpoint, and then there would be solutions which would be installed inside the server. And then when there's a change in the container or when there's a change in the server configuration, then that's the time the scanner would run. But again, a lot of people think that when they use a specific uh, distribution, it's already secured. It's best to assume that any sort of operating system can still be attacked and compromised. So it's still best to have something like this especially when you're dealing with a very critical application. 
Another way to secure applications would be to utilize something called network isolation. When deploying JavaScript applications in production, you would probably be using multiple servers. So one server could be running just the front-end code, one server could be running the database processes, and then one server would be somewhere in the middle connecting the front-end and the database. There would be servers running the background jobs, and so on. So if one of the servers get compromised, then the goal is to make it harder for the attacker to compromise the other servers. That's the reason why it's best to isolate and secure the network with the assumption that maybe one or two of the servers would be compromised and the other servers would at least be protected and there would be enough defenses, especially if someone's already inside the network. So yes, network isolation definitely helps. At the same time, if the connections are limited and there are specific attacks which are prevented because of network isolation, then that's going to be good. Because some attacks would just be a direct bind shell. And if direct attacks are blocked, then it would definitely be harder for some of the attackers to do other types of connections, especially those back to their own attacker machine. So how about IAM privilege escalation? So what is IAM anyway? So IAM means identity and access management. When deploying applications in the cloud, for example, even if the network is secured, if one server gets compromised, some servers may be configured by something called an IAM role. It's some sort of configuration that is attached to the server. So that server now has the extra ability to do certain things like uploading files into a storage bucket or maybe pushing some data into a database or maybe creating or deleting other resources. In some cases, when there's too much trust on what the server can do, then the IAM permissions there would be too powerful. Then when that server gets compromised, then the hacker can te technically take over the entire account, which is what we don't want. So once the attacker can take over the entire account, then they can create tens to hundreds of servers. And yeah, you will be paying for all of those resources running in your cloud account. So again, here you can see that the JavaScript code and the JavaScript application is just one part. And there are other parts you have to secure when dealing with complete applications deployed into production. So how about denial of wallet attacks? So JavaScript can also be used to create resources, serverless resources, such as serverless functions. So instead of managing your, the, own, the entire server, you would just have to worry about your code. So the architecture changes a bit and shifts toward developer experience, where the developer just needs to code the functions, the business logic, and then the cloud provider would take care of the servers. The problem with this approach is that if the developers are not aware that there is something called denial of wallet attacks, then they would just assume that it's OK for the serverless function to scale indefinitely. So when using the cloud, you pay for what you use. So if somebody tries to use the function a million times, then that's going to cost a lot compared to when running the function, let's say four times or five times. So have the security mechanisms infrastructure level to protect the JavaScript code running inside the serverless functions. Now, now let's talk about the last part, securing machine learning powered JavaScript applications. In the past, we've learned that machine learning models are generally de deployed on the backend side. So this is what they call server-side inference. However, nowadays, it's also possible to do inference in the browser. What I mean by that is the machine learning model is downloaded into the client side closer to the user so that you, get, you gain the following benefits. You won't need any servers to run inference. It works offline. 
there's better latency, and it also helps with data privacy depending on the implementation. So that's pretty cool because it makes things faster and it's closer to the user. So in some cases, this is possible for much larger models. This may not be possible, but for simpler use cases and demos, this would do the trick. However, there are some security considerations we have to take into account because anything that's downloaded to the browser may be stolen or could be stolen by malicious attackers. So if there's some sensitive information there in your model and then it gets downloaded by someone, then there. That's one of the risks that's possible when trying this approach. So in most cases, you might decide to lean towards having the machine learning model deployed on the back end instead of using JavaScript and some library to host or quote unquote deploy the model or have it running in the browser. So that's pretty much it. Today, we learned a lot of things. We learned how to secure JavaScript applications, whether they're running in the front end, in the back end, or whether we're trying to run machine learning powered applications using JavaScript in the browser. We definitely talk about the different security mechanisms and approaches to at least manage what attackers can do. And we also explained and discuss a sample scenario on how attackers can take advantage of a vulnerability on the application side and compromise one server, which could lead to a compromise of other servers or potentially the entire cloud account. So thank you again for listening to my talk and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.